Rivers are key to industry. Landscape winding built a revolution, but land means more with mass. Reservoirs built to provide for people, built to provide for a city that would one day have books and films made in its name. But history is better with people, because people fill the pages. But it's a shame because there are those that contribute chapters but are still left to the footnotes. Those who accumulate wealth unimaginable and commission landmarks still standing today but no one knows their name. So you can build a city on industry. That does not make it a man's world because the women take over when war takes men from homes. See, they're the backbone of the workforce. They're the landladies who poison up their sleeves. They're responsible for the strikes and the picket lines. See, this is a city of Epsom, with one woman and a king's horse. It's where Florence still watches over as the ill get well, and it's where the mill churns, but not to produce products to sell. It now produces history. See, Jebediah may have had his invention, but it was his wife and her family and their business that called Darby home. And it was the sons that she bore him that built the first fireproof buildings. It was her laugh that made those houses homes. See, this city has silk throwing mills and flying shuttles to weave its history. It has museums that were once factories that built this country's industry and changed the world in ways you will never know. Simply because the story of Derby women have been left untold. So my inspiration for this project was to do an overview about some of the amazing women we've looked at during the project and some of the ones that we've researched, we found out about, we couldn't talk about because of time or other restrictions and it's kind of to encourage you to go and find out yourself to look at all these women and to kind of discover their stories and find people that inspire you. Curtains judder open, sending sun glares through blackened window panes. Mrs Gardner wipes soot to a smear, waves to commuters and passers-by, welcoming weary legs to pull up a pew. The Brunswick, once a masculine haze, is becoming a hub for skirts and suits to rest under the same roof. Worries fill the corner booth, whispers of absent soldier husbands adjusting to life without love. Blisters cover fingers from munitions and from peeling spuds. The Canary Girls find relief in a tavern run by another of their own. A sanctuary to share their woes, a place to remember to laugh. While the men, propping up the bar, leer and proclaim the working women prostitutes. Wenches don't have the muscle to change barrels, better left with paperwork or wiping dirty bums. Mrs Gardner takes it in her stride taking particular care to learn everybody's name and favourite drink. Good landlords know how to ease throbbing feet and bash the heads of those that need it. Before long, Mr Gardner returns, a broken and bruised version of his former self, but with body still intact. Mrs Gardner welcomes him with embrace, clutching their excited children. The brutes at the bar applaud, the wait is finally over, Mr. Gardner can reclaim the title only a man can hold, landlord. Mr. Gardner releases his family, swaps his boots for brogues, rolls up his sleeves, pulls pints in silence. Mrs. Gardner sighs with defeat, puts the children to bed, rolls up her sleeves, peels spuds and quiet. The soldiers are home. 
but the war is not yet over. The reason I chose the subject I did is because Derby's got so many amazing old pubs. It's some of the oldest in the country and I'm really interested in women's rights so it just seemed like a natural fit for me. Hero, heroine, conductor, conductress, masculine, feminine, patriotic, yes, but defined by a suffix. I bet you didn't know you were signing up for this. 26 and the rest of your life ahead of you. No amount of insurance could have covered this. Leaves on the track, you doing what the trousers do. Putting on the brakes, not a pause but an end stop. Safety overturned, bodies in the garden, yet so many saved on Tramcar 19, except for you. The home on Main Street awaiting your return for six days. If only you could see how far we've come, your headstone, the monument with your name, Salvationist, Lillian Parker. Two. One of six Derby women paving the way for future generations. 52. The number of hours you worked, the number of men replaced by women in transport during the war. 4.45am. Just Mrs Davis, birdsong and the engine humming. An overcast open top with lightly daubed seats. The first feet to peruse these aisles. Taking fares, but is this fare for 19 shillings? less than your predecessor, more threatening than the Zeppelins as you might just keep this job. 3. On the road, riding the first wave in the dark, the Derby duckies drafted by the war, your roles so much bigger than double-deckers, facilities for females, out of the home and onto the bus, off of the bus and into parliament, when tickets become ballots, and gender less of a barrier. I decided to write my poem about Derby women in the First World War, particularly in the transport sort of area. This is something that really spoke to me because when I was researching about women in Derby, I came across the Derby duckies, which were the first women um, to become bus and tram conductors in Derby. And that's something that I thought was really empowering um, because women couldn't do the job roles that men used to do. And with the First World War, this changed and women were able to get a lot more jobs in male roles after that. It's interesting to see how sexism colours history. Bess of Hardwick, best known for building four stately homes and surviving four husbands. A terrifying historical term meaning to outlive one's spouse, but surviving seems so much more fitting for a woman ahead of her time. Male historians of the 19th century like to accuse her of being the worst thing a woman in history can be, ambitious. I don't know why they say it like it's a bad thing. If she was a man, they wouldn't even think twice about it. People fail to put her into context. Born into poverty with no rights as a woman. How was she to survive, let alone thrive, without money? Money that only men and nobility could provide. Married at 15, widowed at 16, lady-in-waiting by 17. History waited as she was introduced to Tudor society, classed Queen Elizabeth I as a close friend, kindred queens. They understood what it means to be a woman in a man's world. 
Bess is my new inspiration. My dream is to become the rich aunt with a suspicious amount of money and a long line of ex-lovers. I too will be called the terror of her husband. I will wear that label with honour, knowing that many great women before me were accused of emasculating men with money and wit. Two historically masculine traits. It's no fun for them to see themselves reflected in women. Wit too often leads to insolence, money leads to freedom. They can only hope that burying you will keep you quiet, but I will shout around mouthfuls of dirt. They take the words of her resentful fourth husband as gospel, paint her as domineering. No doubt she would have been called bossy and her male counterpart determined. Sexism is so ingrained in history. We are taught to resent women who upset the natural order, see them as troublemakers, who use their femininity to their advantage, as if a man has never used his masculinity to excuse his actions. Henry VIII had two of his wives executed for alleged adultery when he grew tired of them, and yet you're telling me women are worse for being opportunistic. Bess was the queen of smiling in the face of adversity, crawling through the dirt to knock on the glass ceiling. Through a series of strategic marriages, she acquired money and land, something that she alone would not be able to own. Her legacy lives on in National Trust heritage. Hardwick Hall stands proudly against the sky donned with the initials ES, as if shouting to the universe, Elizabeth Shrewsbury was here, and you'll not forget it. I hold great affection for the woman who called Derbyshire home. I roam these streets where she paved the way, so women like me today should have the right of any man. She is one of the first rungs on the ladder of feminism, and when we finally reach the top, I will thank every woman before me. Scream their names into the sky. Elizabeth Shrewsbury was here. I'm a great lover of history, and I'm very passionate about telling women's stories, so the best of Hardwick was a brilliant example for me. Lord have mercy on the man that tries to wash the defiant out of me. The one that claims it lingers on the skin like chalk on concrete. Oh, if the bosses only knew how it is spun through their mules, pulled through their power looms, how it hangs on their backs. They are dressed in our hates, tailored top to bottom in the finest resistance that gluttony can't buy. The managers, call us girls to try and make this a quiet war but there is nothing quiet about the women that hold banners outside of Darley Abbey. There has been a picket line lodged in our throats since birth, a hand-me-down from history's umbilical cord. Only now we dare cough it up, vomit our injustice onto your streets bite the hand of the master that tamed our mothers. They used to burn people like us. Now they run from our fires. Let us not brawl with the tight-fisted, but strike with our tongues. Chant our injustice as loud as any church choir. I'm not praying for anything anymore. So, I'm really passionate about protest. Um, it's a big part of my life. And I'm also really passionate about working class history um, and civil rights movements and just, you know, people's rights in general. And in terms of Derby, the silt mill lockout for me is a very important point of Derby's history. And I try and go to the silt mill rally every year when it's on. And I've spoken at the silt mill rally a few times. And I think that's really, important point in the history in terms of um, the trade union movement, in terms of equal pay and equal rights for workers. However, 
What I didn't realise was a thing um, was the Dali Abbey girls strike um, and that's a part of history that I think that a lot of people in Derby and you know and beyond are, are unaware of and I think it's actually really important um, to talk about that and try and raise awareness of that and so that was the inspiration for this poem. The Ballad of Betty Kate O stranger, turn your mind about A stump of wood stands near Unremarked, bleached white and bent Take heed what might you hear I offer you this bygone tale Of earthy Betty Kate The man she loved, her children too Their numbers two and eight A mother's love grown tall and strong Of work both skilled and hard, of laughter up to branches high at home in nature's yard. Bound by love and bound by toil beneath a spreading yew, with trunk for walls and earth for floors, Kate's family and love grew. Charcoal burners of great skill from Papplewick they came, to Derbyshire they walked long roads, seeking work, not fame. No minder for their children fair, no toys save rocks and seeds, hollowed out a cradle branch at home beneath the leaves. Searching for wild sacred spot to walk through smoky air, in shining cliff they made their home neath yew tree tall and fair. A balance kept of air and heat, an alchemy of smoke. Balanced love between them all, they were a cheerful folk. Burning charcoal through long days, the masters of their trades. A shilling for a bag sold on to keep warm others' babes. To not set foot inside a town, save for buying bread. To live life out beneath the boughs, the undergreen to tread. In time became they so well known, famed for their skill and cheer. A painter hired for Betty and home to save in colours clear. The artist called upon them both on greenwood paths about through heavy rains in darkened woods and found Betty bailing out. Lenny sat for sketches first, felt cold bite in those walls. I'm warmer in my small snug hut than in these lavish halls. Then Betty sat down for her sketch, turned lined face to the sky. The painting was completed fair, both caught on canvas lie. A face she'd known each day stared back, cried how old she shone. His arrow back, now round from work. Oh, but he is well he done. The years grew on, their children grown, their work continued on, their lives wreathed round by leaves and smoke, the seasons passed and gone saved up their coins or rolling years until ten pounds sat there a life's reward gold from the green a hope for them to share they welcomed peace into their lives for skill had brought reward a home secure a life content a future to afford alas their hope was cruel disturbed when nameless scoundrel came. Took their coin and wound repaid, Len's life was outlaw's claim. Kate came out from ash and smoke, from green to grey stone town.
to part ways with her only man, his body lowered down. In a memory, she walked long roads, a full five miles between, at age of four and ninety years, then back into the green. Kate lived on, like her yew tree home, for full a hundred years, danced for all her party's night to loud and mirthful cheers. Then she was gone, their home decayed, and this tree silent stood, once a home to two and eight, now sentinel green wood. O stranger, I have told the tale, that stump records the fate, that branches dead once held the love of earthy Betty Kate. Stand you here at Betty's door, hear her words on the breeze. The ghost of laughter in the air, this home among the leaves. O oh, stranger, turn your mind about to tales from silent things. O oh, stranger, if you look, you'll find a tale in every thing. I think I wanted to write about Betty Kate because her story is a remarkable story. Her story is of a woman and her husband who raised eight children in a homemade shack under a yew tree in these woods. And we only have fragments of her story left. And the painting that I mention in the poem is now lost. But the sketches that they sat for that painting still remain. And were it not for those, we would have lost her voice. And I felt that her voice was one that needed to be remembered.